Some people argue that science explains everything, and what it doesn't explain now, it will someday. Consequently, they say, there's no need for the concept of God. The idea is that God was a fiction from the old days, when people didn't have the scientific knowledge we have now. Back then, God filled in the gaps, but now those days are gone. Is this argument valid? First, let's acknowledge that science has indeed come a long way. It's unraveled mysteries of the cosmos, the intricacies of life and the laws of nature. But does that mean it can explain everything? Some would argue that science deals with the how of things, how the universe works, how life evolves. But it doesn't always address the why. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why do we have consciousness? These existential questions often lead people to ponder the existence of something beyond the material world, something like God. Moreover, the God of the gaps argument assumes that gaps in scientific knowledge will always be filled. But what if some gaps are unbridgeable? What if some aspects of our universe are inherently beyond human understanding? Science cannot explain the origin of the universe, although it has done an admirable job of putting forth theories. This origin question is no small matter and philosophers have debated it for millennia. Where did the universe come from? Theists argue the so-called cosmological argument, which points out that everything we know in the physical world seems to have a cause, nothing just pops up out of nowhere. And if you extend this line of thinking backward in time, it stands to reason that there must have been a very first cause of everything. This provides a convenient explanation for nothing less than existence. If God didn't create the universe, then how did it come to be? How can something pop up out of nothing? How can something be caused without a cause. Science's answer, well, the prevailing theory is the Big Bang. With the Big Bang theory, you don't have to explain a starting point because at the precise point when the universe began, uh, referred to as the singularity, um, all physical laws as we know them broke down. An explanation for the beginning of the universe isn't required because, well, the moment was nonsensical anyway. Now, Stephen Hawking developed a no-boundary proposal to describe the beginning of the universe. His Hartle-Hawking state, a theory he created with physicist James Hartle, describes a single starting point of space but no time with nothing before because, as the theory goes, the universe is a closed loop. You could say that the Big Bang is the starting point the way the North Pole is the start of the Earth. But it's really just the northernmost point. There's nothing farther north, just like there's nothing before the Big Bang. In this way, the universe is completely self-contained. But what the theories all have in common is that they are all just that. Theories. When it comes to the origin of the universe, we just don't know. None of us, not you, not me, not even Stephen Hawking knew. This brings us back to the intersection of science and philosophy. While science strives to answer the how, philosophy and theology often tackle the why. So what do you think? If science cannot conclusively explain the origin of the universe, can it do any better with the origin of life? Think about it. Life, conscious, somehow arose from inanimate matter. Is there a scientific explanation? Well, yes, but it's not a very good one. Any explanation science provides would have to account for a serious chicken and egg quandary. Life, as we now know, requires information, which we also now know is encoded in DNA, a polymer that basically acts as the playbook for the functioning, growth and reproduction of every organism. But how did life come about without the necessary information for life? And how did the necessary information come about without life? How, in other words, could something as complex as DNA form on its own? The most recent theory, again just a theory, is something called the RNA world hypothesis that suggests that RNA, a less sophisticated polymer, came around first and paved the way for DNA. But RNA is still incredibly complex and for all intents and purposes, just as impossible to imagine forming by itself. Even proponents of the theory admit that it's a bad one, with at least one proponent acknowledging that it's the worst theory of the early evolution of life, except for all the others. So, where does this leave us? If science struggles to unravel the mysteries of the universe and the origin of life, what about the enigma of human consciousness? For all the amazing work that science has done with the brain, it cannot fully explain human consciousness. More precisely, we can't explain experience. In fact, explaining consciousness is such a hard problem that philosophers, creative and imaginative characters that they are, have come to call it the hard problem of consciousness. This in contrast to the easy problem of consciousness. The easy problem refers to how the brain works, the mechanics of how we sense things, 
process information and how we feel, think and react. Science is pretty good with this how stuff. But the hard problem, how this all adds up to experience, is still a head-scratcher. David Chalmers, a professor of philosophy and neural science at New York University, introduced the term hard problem in a 1995 paper. Chalmers asks about our experience of, well, experience. The brain feeds us data to process, right? Let's say the data is a really sad song. Think of the saddest song you've ever heard. Maybe it makes you sad enough to want to cry. The question is, why do you feel like you want to cry? Why do you feel sad? Why do you feel anything at all? There's nothing we can find in the physical world that accounts for this phenomenon. There's nothing that accounts for the fact that we experience things. There's no universal agreement on what it even means to experience something. Moreover, there's no evolutionary process that can explain how consciousness arose from matter so that we can experience anything in the first place. We might be able to explain how the brain physically evolved, but we can't explain how it jumped from the physical to the conscious. In fact, how could our brains have even evolved physically if consciousness wasn't present in the first place to inform us through our experiencing of the world and thus guide us in such a way that we could survive and presumably evolve? Daniel Dennett, a famous philosopher and scientist and ardent atheist, does just this. In fact, he denies consciousness, thus solving in one fell swoop the hard problem thereof. The concept is an abstraction in Dennett's view, so why all the fuss? It's an illusion. Indeed, there's a whole philosophical train of thought called illusionism that contends that consciousness is a figment of the brain's imagination. So, where do you stand on this fascinating debate? Well, here's the thing. If there is more to the universe than the natural world, science will never be able to help us because everything beyond the natural world is out of science's purview. There is the natural world, and there is perhaps the spiritual world. Science can only deal with the former, but that doesn't negate the possibility of the latter, which doesn't play by the rules of science and can therefore go unrecognized by it. Scientists understand this, which might explain a Pew survey that revealed that 51% of scientists believe in God. Listen to quantum physicist Erwin Schrödinger, he of Schrödinger's cat fame. I am very astonished that the scientific picture of the real world around me is very deficient. It knows nothing of beautiful and ugly, good and bad, God and eternity. And it's not just that these sorts of concepts are outside of science's domain. It's also a question of gaining the proper perspective to study them objectively. Nobel Prize winning physicist Max Planck considered the father of quantum physics, put it like this, science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature. And that is because in the last analysis, we ourselves are part of nature and therefore part of the mystery that we are trying to solve. Think about studying consciousness, for instance, as conscious beings using our consciousness, the very thing we are trying to study. See the problem, we're on the inside, trying to study an external objective reality. And think about this for a second. Science assumes there is an objective reality to study, but what is this assumption based on since we can't get outside of it? Good question. Planck had the only answer. Over the entrance to the gates of the temple of science are written the words, ye must have faith. Faith precedes reason, even in science, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the nature of human consciousness. These seem destined to remain mysteries, leaving the door open for at least considering the possibility of God. If you're hell-bent on not believing, for whatever reason, you'll find better arguments against God's existence, but there are some great arguments for the existence of God 